The original Guild Wars, these days referred to as Prophecies, was released all the way back in 2005. Over the following three years, two standalone expansions and one true expansion pack were released, these being Factions, Nightfall and Eye of the North respectively. Just to make it easier for this video, when I refer to the original Guild Wars, I mean all four of these games collectively, unless specified otherwise. Upon release, Guild Wars was usually compared to games that fall into the MMORPG genre, games like World of Warcraft, City of Heroes and Star Wars Galaxies. However, it soon became apparent that it was not a true, massively multiplayer online role-playing game. It was certainly a role-playing game, with a world inspired by traditional western fantasy tropes, a climactic end-of-the-world storyline, and a variety of classes to choose from and skills to level up from experience points gained from killing monsters. And it was certainly massive in terms of the amount of other players that could be interacted with in-game. However, these interactions were limited to outpost areas, so while the amount of players certainly was massive, the number of players that could be engaged with each other in multiplayer was considerably lower. But it was still an online only game where players adventured across the world, killing mobs of monsters, taking on bosses and exploring dungeons with their spellcasters and armoured melee soldiers and summoners. Once you stepped out of the outposts however, you were limited to interacting with the players in your party, which was up to 7 other people. Upon exiting an outpost you are entered into your own instance of the world. This applies to both general exploration and quest completion, as well as for the story based missions that opened up new areas and outposts. These instance areas meant that the terrain and landscape could be altered by the players, whether that be growing vine bridges in the jungle or destroying barriers to open up secret paths. This also meant that once an enemy was dead, they stayed dead until you reloaded the area later on. You don't need any respawning enemies for other players if there are no other players to kill them. And I believe it's because of this difference that Guild Wars cannot be classed as an MMORPG. Instead, it is classed as a CORPG, which, according to Google, stands for Competitive Online Role Playing Game. I assume this is referring to the PvP side of things, of which I have no experience, so I prefer the term Cooperative Online Role Playing Game, which I think fits the PvE perfectly and manages to keep the same acronym, which is just damn convenient. Fast forward to 2012 and Guild Wars 2 has been released. This game is a true MMO, but with some of the negative aspects that have become associated and accepted in the genre removed for a more player friendly approach. There's no kill stealing, no queues for bosses, and any grinding is mixed up enough to be a little bit less monotonous, and players can drop in and out of instant dungeon runs as often as they like. So if your internet drops an hour into a run, you can just wait for it to calm itself down and join right back in. There are many other improvements that I feel this game has over other MMOs, but that's not what this video is really about. Before we go any further, I just want to state that I really enjoyed Guild Wars 2. In fact, according to the in-game stats, I've spent just over 374 hours playing that game. At the end of 2015, its first expansion was released, Heart of Thorns, uh, which I went and picked up. But then I stopped playing partway through that. I stopped because they introduced two new traversal mechanics that you had to level up to a certain point to access the next story mission. This is a problem I had with the base game, but to a lesser degree. In the base game, each mission would have a recommended level, which wasn't really a recommendation because I was nowhere near good enough to beat them on a lower level. So after completing a mission that ended with me finding out where the primeval dragon champion was hiding and the best way to go about killing it, I'd have to pop off to the mountains for an hour or so and clean graffiti off rocks, or pop off back to a farm in Kreuter to help scare off the vermin that are pestering the cattle. I think it's fair to say this sort of broke the immersion of the game as well as the urgency portrayed in the story cutscenes. And while I do realise that doing these activities gets you out and exploring the world a bit more, I feel like the system from the original Guild Wars was a better one, which still had you going out and exploring. When you completed a mission in that game, you'd be dropped in an outpost and given a mainline quest, which would eventually lead you to the next mission outpost. Along the way, you could find other quests which would take you to new areas and usually drop a nice bit of world building and lore along with your experience points for your troubles. You were never forced to do them, but completing them would teach you a little bit more about the world you're exploring and make the next mission a little bit easier for you if you did enough to level up a couple of times. In its defence, ArenaNet did eventually update the story mission level requirement system in Guild Wars 2. You now unlock a whole chapter of missions every 10 levels, 
which sounds great, but just completing the story missions may gain you three or four additional levels, if you're lucky. Which leaves you with six or seven levels worth of community service to crack on with until the end of the world is finally allowed to continue. Tied into all this is the exploration side of the game. Like I said, I've spent just over 370 hours playing this game, so exploration isn't exactly what I'd call bad per se. It's just not as good as what was in the original Guild Wars, at least in my humble opinion. In Guild Wars 2, you go out alone or with friends and explore the same world as everyone else on that server. With friends, this is fine. Great even. In fact, that's pretty much what this entire genre is built for. Exploring fantasy worlds with your friends. But solo, it's not so much fun. Still doable and usually not a massive headache, but it has its drawbacks thanks to the respawning enemies. Whereas the original game had enemies that knew how to stay dead, Guild Wars 2 has to consider that a group of players could be rolling through that area 3 minutes after you. So for a solo player, carefully pulling monsters from a group one at a time so that they don't get overwhelmed, they also have to worry about getting out of there before the last group they carefully eliminated suddenly fades back into existence and demanded vengeance. Now I imagine to a lot of people, this sounds like a hell of an odd criticism for someone talking about an MMO. These games aren't designed for solo play, so play with some friends instead. Unfortunately, there comes a time in everyone's life when arranging for a group of you and your friends to all be online at the same time with a reasonable amount of time to get through it all increasingly difficult. For instance, one of the people I used to play with can now only get on late in the evening on a Sunday, which is no good for the rest of us because we all have to work on Monday morning, and others have just lost interest in the game. Which happens over time, it happens with all games, but it's a huge shame for those of us that still want to play the game. Especially for me after seeing trailers for the new Living World season showing off the White Mantle logo. And I really want to know what happened to those guys after the original game. But this is a problem that the original Guild Wars just doesn't have. Or rather, does absolutely everything it can to stop this from being a problem in the first place. In the original game, you had heroes and henchmen. Henchmen were AI units that you could party up with to take the place of any missing human players. The explorable areas were designed to be taken on with a full group of players at a certain level bracket, so if you couldn't get a full party, you could replace them with the henchmen to at least keep the number of targets for your enemies high enough to stand a good chance. Later on, heroes were introduced, which were basically customisable henchmen that could be given basic commands. While heroes and henchmen could never properly replace the reflexes and situational awareness of a human player, they at least offered a passable alternative for anyone who didn't have the luxury of other players in their party. Which, considering the game is still active now, is a big deal. I recently reinstalled the original, mainly for a bit of a nostalgia kick, but also to see if anyone is actually still playing it. Turns out there are a few people. Not many though. In fact, the European servers are pretty much empty these days. But this only really affects the outposts. Out in the world, with your party of AL compatriots, it's still business as usual. Keeping the gameplay in an instance environment means that you feel like you're really having an impact on the world. Once you've massacred your way through a village of misunderstood bird people, they stay dead. If they were to just respawn a couple of minutes later, you'd feel no sense of accomplishment from overcoming those odds and succeeding. Plus, if you manage to go full genocide and kill every enemy in that area, you're then free to explore the environment at your leisure, picking up bits of lore from the NPCs and turning in quests without being harassed by some irritable wildlife. Apart from giving you time to take a breather and appreciate the challenge you've just overcome, this made those ancient deserts and unearthed temples feel like the barren wastelands and haunting environments they were supposed to be. There was a sense of isolationism in the large open areas. Having no waypoints throughout these areas also meant that fighting through to the end and discovering a new outpost felt like an achievement in itself. And when the map description of the outpost tells the story of a heavily guarded citadel lodged between two dangerous enemy territories offering sanctuary to travellers, it makes the world feel alive. It gives a sense of place and history to your surroundings, and makes that trek you just fought tooth and nail to get through feel more like part of your own epic adventure. What I'm trying to get at here, in my own roundabout sort of way, is that the original Guild Wars struck an excellent middle ground between an MMORPG and a single player role playing game experience. In doing so, it created its own genre, which after scouring the internet looking for other examples, seems to be a genre comprised entirely by itself. There are no other games that fall into the CORPG category, making Guild Wars a truly unique collection of games. With all that said, I'm aware that many of the changes made in the sequel just had to be done. 
Guild Wars was by no means a perfect game, and the only way to make those improvements properly was to wipe the slate clean and start again from the ground up. Anyone who ever had to look for two monks to fill out the party for an endgame mission will tell you that there were fundamental problems that needed to be addressed. Which, if I do say so myself, Guild Wars 2 addresses very well. But in crossing over into MMO territory, it's lost a sense of identity, it's lost some of its immersion, and it's cost us the ability to have an impact on the game world. Which wouldn't be as big of a problem if the original didn't get me so invested in the story of the world of Tyria.